Hello, lovers of Yeshua and his Torah word. This is Nathan Lawrence coming to you from the beautiful Oregon coast. Today is Shabbat. The sun is set, setting toward the first day of the week. I invite you to join me for a teaching I just gave to our online Shabbat Zoom meeting. What it is to be a prophetic intercessor, what it is to stand in the gap, to be a repairer of the breach, to help prepare the way for Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua, who is the ultimate repairer of the breach, the one who came to redeem and to save us and bring us to the Father. We are in a time of great spiritual darkness, the rise of Antichrist and evil all around us, like a tidal wave, like an ocean covering this earth. He has called us to stand in the gap, to be repairers of the breach, to build up the fallen places and the weak places starting in our own lives and then those around us in our ministries in our churches and in the society around us that is our only hope is to follow Yeshua and to do what he did when he died on the cross when he cried out and he reached out his arms to all those who were lost and all those who are drowning in the sea of their own sin and the sea of of, of despair and confusion. And I talk about that in the video that follows. Shabbat Shalom everyone, uh, Nathan Lawrence here, Hoshana Rabbah. And so I am on the Oregon coast, overlooking the Oregon coast, the sound of the uh, waves in the background. And so I'm not in my regular chicken house studio at uh, my house. I'm down here on the Oregon coast. And so the lighting is not really good. Uh, it's a bright sunny day. And even though I have the uh, curtains drawn, the sun is still coming through. And that's great. This is uh, in the middle of December. And to have a sunny, almost a cloudless day with the wind not blowing um, across the Pacific Ocean onto the Oregon coast is very rare. I was out early this morning walking on a, a headland just outside of our, our house here. And was walking and praying and looking at the the waves crashing up against the rocks and, and, and the white foam and the blue sea and the blue sky. Oh, anyway, I wish you could all be here. It is truly a, a wonderful thing and it makes you feel very small compared to the ocean. And the ocean is a drop of water compared to the greatness of our Yehovah Yeho Elohim. So I praise his name. But today I want to talk about um, the role of the intercessor, what it means to stand in the gap. Um, some of you are very gifted at intercession. You love to pray. And anytime there's a prayer meeting, you are there. And you're praying for people. And this is a very, very important thing. Um, I think we're all, we're all called to be intercessors. Some people, however, e eat intercession for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. We all have our giftings and callings. I want to read, yes, Ezekiel 22, verse 30 where it talks about standing in the gap. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And we are living in very, very perilous times. Anybody who is has their eyes open even remotely and is aware of what's going on in the world around them knows that there are things happening in the world 
in ways that we've never seen in the history of humanity. And these things point to Bible prophecy, end time Bible prophecy being fulfilled. We've talked many times about these things and I won't go into it. Um, Ezekiel 22, but it weighs very heavily on our heart. And in the United States, for example, and we have people listening to us from other countries and you are going through similar things in your countries as well. But the United States, we are on the cusp of civil war. Uh, we are in a cold civil war right now, politically speaking, um, between one side and the other. And we have presidential elections coming up shortly. And however those elections go, you're going to have, whether they go one way or the other, you're going to have one half of the country happy and one half of the country very, very angry. And there will be a part of, a, 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 probably a minority, but a, a vocal, very vocal minority in either side, that if they don't get their way, there could be a lot of troubles in society. And I'm talking violence, criminality. It could be a very dangerous and unstable civil unrest situation. And this is all by design and purpose and it is planned. And behind it all is Satan the devil who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy everything that's good. And so he raises one side up against another and they pit themselves against each other to destroy each other so that the people behind the scenes who are tipping the balances one way or the other and Satan is in charge of this can then bring in their agendas. Out of order comes chaos, out of chaos comes order. The Hegelian dialectic. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but some of you do and you understand what I'm talking about. If you know who Hegel was, you know who Marx was, you understand the Hegelian dialectic. And this has been, it's, it's about divide and conquer. Okay, we could talk for hours on these things. But suffice it to say, Satan is in charge. Ezekiel 22. And this is, this is, the prophet here is speaking about the sins of Jerusalem. But history repeats itself again and again and again. And so this may be specifically addressing God's people, Elohim's people in Jerusalem, but it can just as well apply to the church, the modern 21st century church system in the world today, in many, many places, in many nations. Verse 23, And the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy, conspiracy. The Bible has a lot to say about conspiracy. I have pages and pages of, of, of Bible, uh, Bible references to plots, conspiracies, and things like that, that the Bible talks about. And people say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Go ahead, rip out the pages out of your Bible and bury your head in the sand and say that this does not go on today. There have always been plots and conspiracies of evil, demonic, satanic people trying to take over the world, trying to take over churches, trying to take over ministries, trying to deceive for money, for power, for sex, for influence, or whatever. It all started in the Garden of Eden. Satan was the first conspir was the first conspiratorialist. 
His conspiracy was against Elohim. It's the perennial battle between good and evil, between the forces of Messiah and the forces of anti-Messiah or anti-Christ. Verse 25, the conspiracy of her prophets. So this was a conspiracy in the church, if you will, of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured people. They have taken treasure and precious things. Oh, yes. These were for-profit prophets. Anytime a prophet comes and they ask for money or they ask to pass the plate in the church, they are not a prophet of Elohim. They may be prophetic, and like I like to say, emphasize the word ik, like as in icky, prophetiki. I once had a fellow come into my congregation when I was pastoring, and he said, I'm a non-profit prophet. And he was really upset when I would not allow him to sell his books and other things on the table in the back of the room during Shabbat. Needless to say, that was the first and the last time he ever spoke in my congregation. The conspiracy of, your, of her prophets in her midst like a roaring lion, tearing the prey, making merchandise of the people of Yovah, tearing them apart. Why? They have devoured people. They have taken pre treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Oh, yes. I could take my shirt off right now and show you the scars. No, not literally, but figuratively. I had, I was raised in a church till I was 30. The pastor, who claimed to be, in essence, a prophet, <clears throat> disinherited through connivings my family of our farm that my great-grandparents came and bought when they immigrated from Germany in 1906. And he connived to take the farm, the homes, and the possessions. And my parents were left with nothing. Oh, yes. After they had lived there, my mom was, was born there. And I grew up there. And that minister and his family and those around him got to enjoy the loot. Oh, yes. Interestingly enough, that particular pastor who I idolized before I woke up, he died prematurely at a young age. Two days, one or two days before probate was finished and he got to enjoy the benefits of it. Now his wife, his kids, and some of those around him got to enjoy it, but he never did. He never saw a penny of it. And you all have your stories too, I'm sure. Verse 26, they have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law, my Torah. Profane my holy things. Oh, yes, we could talk a lot about that in the churches that we've come out of. And they have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. If you don't even know what the Torah is, you don't know what holiness is. And it's not smoking, chewing tobacco, dancing, playing cards, or 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 um, or, or um, you know going to movies 
or, you know, this kind of thing. Okay, some of those things could be sinful and may, they may be not be good, but that's not the definition of holiness. Biblically, it's Torah obedience. That's the definition of holiness. So they have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. They don't even know what it is, most of them, because they've rejected to one degree or another Yehovah's Torah and say it's been done away with. And they have not made the difference between the clean and the unclean. We could talk about that. Shabbat, the dietary laws, the feast days, it's about making a difference between the holy and the unholy the sacred and the profane. I guarantee you, when you're not doing the world's holidays, when you keep Shabbat and you're not eating the world's food, it will keep you separate from the world. This is a holiness issue. Yeah, it's a health issue too, resting and not eating bad food. I get it, but it's a holiness issue. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths. Sabbaths, plural. Shabbat and the feasts. You Seventh-day Adventists, shame on you. Yeah, you keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, but you have profaned his Sabbaths along with your other harlot daughters that are break-offs of the Roman Catholic Church the mother whore of the whole thing. So that I am profaned among them. I, you pollute the Sabbaths. You pollute his holy things. And we all have done it and all have had to repent of it. And some of us still may be doing it. So it's time to grow up and f have the fear of Elohim and respect his words and his commandments that are not just suggestions, but they are commandments, imperative commands. My Sabbaths, my feasts, my Seventh-day Sabbath is forever. And it's for all people. There's one law for the Gentiles and for the Israelites. Not two laws, one law. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do not change. I am not a man that I should lie. So that I am profaned among them. Verse 27. Here her princes, those are the religious leaders, in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey to shed blood to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. Oh, yes. Most of your pastors out there, not all, most are in it for the money. Most of your leaders are in it for the money. Oh, they put on a good front. I was raised in a denomination where the leaders were a bunch of greedy... I won't say it. I idolize him. Yeah, Mike's laughing. He gets it. I idolize these people, and they were good. Oh, they were good. It's like the politi politician who goes to Washington, D.C. to do good, and he did very well indeed, if you get what I mean. Her princes shed the blood to destroy people to get dishonest gain. Oh, yes. Give us all your money so that we can live high on the hog and you can live like impoverished peasants. And I grew up around such people. My parents were one of them. We tithed like crazy, and my parents didn't have any money to give to me, to their children. I had to go out and earn it by mowing people's grass, their lawns. That's how impoverished we were because we gave it all to the church so that the ministers could live luxuriously and drive around in fancy cars and in jets and have mansions 
and on and on. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining laws, lies. Thus says Adonai Yehovah, when Yehovah had not spoken, be very, very careful with people who say, God told me this and God told me that, and then they purport to have the truth. I was raised in a church, and some of you have been in those churches, where the leader claimed to have an inside track with Yehovah. He claimed to have all of this revelation given to him personally. And then we find out he plagiarized it and stole it without giving credit to several people whose names I could name and has been proven I was raised to believe this man was God's divine instrument. And you, some of you have been in churches like that. The, the Catholic Church is a great example of that. So is the Mormon Church. So is the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, and, and others that have lift up individuals as being, you know, the, the prophet or the prophetess that they look to. Be very careful about things like this, churches like this. The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy. When I grew up, I had like three pairs of shoes, three pairs of pants. I mean, that's all. Drove old cars. If we hadn't lived on a farm, I don't think we could have afforded to live because we raised all of our own food and we, 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 we put it all together ourselves. Very, very poor. We, we weren't hungry, but we were at the lower end of the economic scale. So I sought for a man among them who might, would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. And then he goes on to talk about the wrath. Judgment. So imagine a wall. Maybe some of you have traveled. If not, you've seen pictures of the wall around Jerusalem. Or maybe walls around medieval cities. I've traveled in Europe and in Israel, and, and I've seen these walls. I've walked around the walls in England and in France and seen them in Spain and, and in, in Italy and in, um, in Jerusalem, medieval walls to keep the enemy out. And imagine a wall that's got a big gap on it through which the enemy can enter. It was the role of the prophet, the intercessor, of the leaders to go into those weak areas and to fill them up with rocks and to fill up the gaps so that the enemy could not get in. But these people, these so-called leaders, they were putting rocks in there, but they were not using the proper kind of mortar, the plaster. It says here, you use untempered mortar. When you're building a wall, you've got to use the right kind of mortar and you've got to mix the right amount of water with it, whether it's cement or mortar with bricks. You know, all of us have probably worked with mortar and cement a little bit at least, and you know you've got to use the right mixture, the right amount of lime and sand and, and rock and whatever else they put in there. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart. And we've all seen foundations and we've all seen 
cement work that wasn't done properly and starts to crumble and fall apart. If it's done properly, it will last forever. The Panama Canal. I've been through the Panama Canal on a ship. When they were building the Panama Canal in the early 1900s, the use of cement for construction purposes was very new. Nothing on that scale had ever been done before to build these amazing locks and walls and dams and all these things to make the Panama Canal. Go read the history, go read the books. Cement is, we know it, concrete was a new thing. And so they were very careful to get the exact right kind of sand, the right kind of all the ingredients, and they had special plants, industrial facilities that they made in order to mix the right amount and get it perfect. It was really a quite an engineering process, and they knew that they needed to get it right, otherwise those walls would fall apart. And all this effort that they went to would fall apart. And I will say, the Panama Canal, now they built a new one, but the old one, that's over 100 years old. It's about 120, no, about 115 years old. I think it was finished in like 1913 or 12 or somewhere in there. It took 10 years to build or so. Those, that cement is solid. When we were going through there on the ship, I could almost reach out and touch the wall. It is solid. They did the right thing. They did the right kind of cement. It's still there. And that's what Yah is calling his people to do. We're not in this thing for gain or for money or for profit. We want to shore up people with the truth, with the solid rock of truth, of righteousness, and to know what is truth or not. You've got to know what Yehovah's definition of holiness and righteousness is. If you throw out two-thirds of the Bible and say it doesn't really apply to me because it's in the Old Testament or it was for the Jewish people or whatever, or we're not under the law, you are now daubing the people with untempered mortar. If you are a Bible teacher, a so-called prophet, or a pastor or whatever, you are not teaching the whole counsel of Jehovah's word. So when Yah was asking for somebody to stand in the gap and he found nobody, when there's a gap in that wall, we've got some folks from um, the Netherlands that are watching us. And uh, a, a large part of the Netherlands, at least the area that used to be the Zyder Z, that was under, that was um, um, under ocean water. And it was a long process starting hundreds of years ago, but it was not completed until a few decades ago when they got the, they, they had the technology to little, little by little over the last hundred years, they built the polders, the dikes and, 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 um, around different parts of the Zyder Z, and eventually then they built the big one across where it opens up in the ocean, and now that land has been reclaimed. And there were times when some dikes were there, and like during, I think during World War II, uh, or maybe before that, I don't remember the history, but there were some really bad storms, and some like really bad storms, and dikes, the dikes were uh, were broken and water came in. And now they have, you know, dikes in place that can withstand that. Same thing that happened during Hurricane Katrina in, what was that, 2006 down in Louisiana. The dikes broke and the water came in. And so now they have built the dikes higher. And there's many examples like this. So, it's like, 
It's like Peter or whoever it was in the story when the when one of the dikes in 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 Holland began, you know, and he, and he stuck his finger in there in the hole in the dike to keep the water from flowing in. You know, and, and so the, the hole wouldn't get any larger. And this is what a prophet has to do. He sees the holes or or a teacher. He sees or she sees the holes in the wall and he goes or she goes in there and stands in the gap and says, okay, it warns the people, you need to fill this hole up. The hole is going to be areas of misunderstanding, areas where they're not walking in holiness and righteousness, areas where people have grown lukewarm or lax or where the enemy can come in, a chink in the armor, so to speak, the this, this shield. And... Yah is calling for people to come in and to stand in the gap and to warn the people. This is, a, this is a weak area. You need to get stronger in that area. You need to repent of the sin so the enemy cannot come in and then make that weak area, turn it into a strong area, into with rocks and with the right kind of mortar. Elsewhere we, we read where the where the 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 the, the carnal for profit prophets um, came, you know, they 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 tried to patch the wall up, but they didn't use the right kind of mortar and rocks. And when the wind came and the rain, it washed the the mortar away, and and the, and it all fell apart. And that wind and that rain is the judgments of Yehovah Elohim, or just the rigors of the world that will come against us. And if we're not strong and we don't have a strong wall, it will destroy us. That is what I have been called to do and you have been called to do. Wherever we can to try to warn people, to let the light of the truth of Yehovah shine into those weak areas where people need to get lined up with the word of Elohim. This is the John the Baptist, the, the, the uh, Elijah ministry preparing the way for Yeshua. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's another way of saying, stand in the gap, sound the alarm, and pray but it's not just about prayer people have made this only about prayer and interceding no it's about getting out there and sounding the alarm and writing and making videos and 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 sharing the gospel and wherever he has you placed not just lit, being a prayer warrior that's fine but it's so much more than that so Yova was looking for somebody who would stand in the gap before Yehova on behalf of the land that Yah shouldn't destroy it. An intercessor can avert divine judgment and the consequences of sinful actions upon a person or a nation or a land before Yehova in the courts of heaven. So, you know, Moses was an intercessor. When the children of Israel worshipped at the golden calf, he went and interceded. So there is, before Yehovah, who wanted to destroy them. So there is a place for prayer and intercession before the courts, the court of heaven. But sometimes... Like Nehemiah, you've got to get out there where the wall is broken down and start to build the wall up around Jerusalem. It wasn't just good enough to pray, oh Lord, we pray that this wall will be supernaturally built and all this ruined wall around the temple will just, all the stones will come together. No, he got out there and he got workers together and they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand, and they were putting rocks together and, 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 and mortaring them 
while they were fighting off the enemy at the same time. So the word gap there in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, is the word peretz, P-E-R-E-T-S, peretz. It's a Hebrew word, where Yah is looking for somebody to stand in the gap. And the word peretz means a break or a breach, a breach in the wall, a break, an opening. This gap is a breach or a break also in a relationship between Yah and his people because of sinful behaviors. So when we are engaged in sin and we're not obeying his Torah, like it says there in Ezekiel 22, that causes to one degree or another a break in our relationship with Yehovah. And that's where also in that same passage, Yehovah talks about making a difference between the holy and the profane. If we are polluting his Sabbaths, like he mentions there, or other things, or we're in the ministry for money, or have false motives or ulterior motives, we're not going to be able to warn the people. We are part of the problem, not part of the solution. So this is not a popular ministry to be in. where you warn the people. John the Baptist got his head cut off because of it. And so did a lot of the other prophets. They suffered. Jeremiah was thrown into, into the dungeon multiple times. Daniel went in the lion's den. And the three Hebrew children went into the fiery furnace. Joseph, because of, he was prophetic, he was sold into slavery. And spent, what, 17 years as a slave and a prisoner? Before Yah rescued him. Yeshua was crucified. Stephen was stoned. Ezekiel was taken captive. Jeremiah was taken captive to Egypt. Elijah and Elisha were not popular. And we could go down the list of all the other prophets that warned the people that stood in the gap it wasn't live long O king and prosper it wasn't be blessed and have a wonderful life it wasn't jesus loves you and has a wonderful life it was repent or perish repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand that was the message So sin causes a break or a gap or a breach so that the, ri the river of Yah's blessing or favor is broken over his people. It brings destruction and judgment. Well, that's what we read in Ezekiel 22. Uh, in my notes here, it says to take a look at uh, Isaiah 58, verse 12. Let's read that. Oh yeah, here it is. Those from, among you, those from among you, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Now, this is a prophecy about Yeshua. In my Bible, the word repairer of the breach is in capital letters. It's a re reference to, it's another name for Yeshua. But that's also the ministry that we have been called to. We've got to do that in our own lives first before we can go out and help other people. Heal thy own self, physician. I grew up on a farm. We had fences and gates and barns. And we had to make sure that there weren't holes in the fences. The gates weren't broken down. It was my job to keep the fences mended. 
Otherwise, the animals, the livestock would get out or the predators would get in. And that we had that happen before. And that's not a pretty scene when you go and you've got slaughtered animals in your, you know, in your pasture or in the chicken house or wherever. One time we had, we had ducks and we had them in a pan of chicken wire. There was about, I don't know, six, six feet high. <clears throat> I went out one morning to, to get the ducks to feed the ducks. And they were all, it was a mangled mess. All just torn apart, dead. A raccoon had climbed up over the fence, gotten in and killed them all. Very sad. So what did I have to do? I had to put chicken wire over the top of the whole pen so they could not, nothing could climb in. And after that, never had a problem. That's exactly what will happen if we don't have a wall around ourselves and we don't have leaders and teachers and modern day Elijah's and John the Baptist warning us. The enemy will come in and destroy us one little bit at a time. And that's what's happening to the West to church in the West. It's been going on for a hundred years. Go read Francis Schaeffer. Go read A.W. Tozer. They were people that were warning the church to repent. And there have probably been a few others. While the rest of them are out there building, you know, the, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, you know, prophetic -y, charismaniac kinds of people are out there building their mansions, flying around in their jets, living in their mansions, telling you, if you give me your last bit of money, you will receive a hundredfold return. The Jan and Paul Crouches of the world, the Kenneth Copelands, the Kenneth Hagans, the Oral Roberts, the T.D. Jakes, the Jesse Duplantis's, the Joyce Myers. Oh yeah, I can name them all. I've listened to them all. I've been there, done that. Joel Osteen's. And there's many others that are making suckers of Yas people in America and elsewhere. The Joseph Prince is over there and wherever he's at, Singapore or somewhere over there, Thailand, Indonesia, I don't know where he's at. He's over there. So there's many of them. They're Saul's, as in King Saul. We've been called to be a repairer of the breach. If you turn from your, the next verse, verse 12, Isaiah 58, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy, this is Isaiah saying the same thing a hundred years before Ezekiel. The message was the same. Isaiah was 100, 120 years earlier. They still had the same problem. These prophets of Elohim were, 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 were preaching the same message. And we're preaching the same message today. Nothing has changed. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, and, and shall honor him by not doing your own ways, and so forth and so on, I will make you to ride on the high place, high hills of the earth. 14. Yes, when we obey Elohim, the river of life flows. The blessings flow. It says here a little bit earlier, if you do what is right, verse eight, then your light, verse eight, you shall, your light shall bring, uh, sh shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of Jehovah shall be your rear guard. Oh, do we, do we want the glory to be, of Elohim to be our rear guard? Yes, I want my flank to be protected by Yovah because I can't see back there. And then you shall call and Yovah will answer. There's many more things in that chapter that we could talk about, but we'll move on. 
Psalms 106, verse 23. I don't even know what this says. Let me look it up real fast. I have it here in my notes. But it relates to this. Psalm 106. What did I say? Verse 3. Where are we? Yeah, 23. Therefore, he said... He's talking about the children of Israel. Therefore, he, Yovah, said that he, Yovah, would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest we, he destroy. You know, there are a lot of prophetic intercessors out there, and Yah bless them. But they're not even walking in obedience themselves. How can you be an intercessor when you're not even, you, your life isn't even lined up with the word of Elohim and you, you rip out half the Bible and say it doesn't even apply to us. I'm speaking to those in the Christian church. You wonder why nothing has happened. I used to hang out with the prophetic intercessors back in the 1990s. They do the prayer marches and the Jericho marches and we go into the gates of the city and do all that and do spiritual mapping. And have you done, done some of that? I hung out with these guys and they were respected and they were prophesying this and prophesying that. They weren't even walking in Torah to a very large degree. And we wonder why we haven't seen this, this prophetic intercessory movement has been going on for 35 years. And we haven't seen any change in the nation. It's still going down the, down the hell hole. Maybe if they, judgment begins first at the house of Elohim. Maybe if they started preaching the truth to the church, like we're trying to do, that nobody's listening to us except a few. Yeah, I put up videos and a few hundred listened to them. But there's millions of Christians let the show go on. The show must go on. Keep that money flowing in our direction so we can live high on the hog at your expense. Well, that's not what they tell you, but that's what it boils down to for most of them. Oh, enough already of this stuff. So were not for Moses standing in the breach, Yah would have destroyed Israel for its sin of faithlessness and unbelief and disobedience to Yah. So we can pray and intercede all we want, but if we're not walking in righteousness ourselves, as we're pointing the finger at the world, we got three fingers pointing back at us and one finger pointing up at Elohim. Psalm 144, 14. I don't know why I'm so fired up today. I don't know what that's all about. Maybe somebody needs to hear this. I'm just sick of this world. I want to see righteousness. I want to see the love of Yeshua, the real love of you, not just throwing our emotions at, oh, Jesus, I love you. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a game and a show. We show love is an action. We show we love him, not by going to church and turning on, flipping on the switch and speaking in tongues and, and throwing our arms up and making a big show in front of all of our pharisaical, sadduceical friends. Love is an action. If you love me, obey me. Show me you love me. Don't just throw your emotions at me and play the church game. Church, you know, do your church gig. Get your spiritual fix by going to church. And then you live like the devil the rest of the week. Oh, I'm a good Christian. I got more Christmas lights on my house than anybody else. I got a bigger Santa Claus. I got a bigger Easter bunny. I can put my Halloween lights up. Oh, give me a break. I say Merry Christmas. I'm really declaring my faith. Merry Christmas. Give me a break. I don't think so. That may impress you and it may impress your friends. 
It don't impress Yehovah Elohim. He wants your heart. He wants your obedience. He wants you to be the Lord. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And that means you, we obey what he says. Where was I? 140. Psalm 144, 14. You know, I'm going to put this video up on my YouTube channel. And you know, if I speak about prophecy, I speak about the end times. I speak about the new world order. Oh, hundreds of people watch that video. Maybe even a few thousand. But when I preach about things like this, eh, 150, 200, 225, maybe 300 out of, even though I've got, what, 11 or 12,000 subscribers on my little rinky-dink YouTube channel. But maybe one person will hear it and will be stirred up and maybe that will make all the difference in the world. I pray y'all. You know, we're like John the Baptist just crying in the wilderness and a few people hear us. Yeshua spoke to thousands of people and there were only about 120 in the upper room when all was said and done. May Yah let us not despise a day of small beginnings and may Yah somehow use our tiny pipsqueak efforts for his glory. We do what we can with what we have. Okay, Psalm 144, 14. Did we already read that? I don't think so. Is this right? Oh, yeah. So, and 10,000 are fields and the oxen oh, may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our cities. Uh, I think that's, again, showing where the word peretz is used as a, you know, as a, as a, a protective barrier around Yah's people. Okay, let me see if I can wind this down. The role of the intercessor is to, to put a hedge or a fence so the enemy cannot break in. Therefore, the role of the intercessor is to stand in the gap so that the enemy it can't break in, so that divine judgment can't come because of one's sins or that of one's of, sins of one's forefathers. In 2 Samuel uh, 6, verse 8, that's the story of Uzzah, where he put his hands on the ark. It was the ark of the covenant when it was coming back on the cart from the Philistines, and he steadied it so it wouldn't fall down, uh, fall off, and he was struck down. Well, first of all, they weren't bringing the ark in properly. It was supposed to be carried on poles by Levites, and it wasn't supposed to be touched by anybody else but the word parets here is used um, of evident i think yeah because as a disregard of the law a sin occurred and a breach in yah's favor occurred and ju divine judgment fell on him so divine judgment falls on us when we don't obey when his commandments and a breach comes up. There's a breach, a break in relationship, and judgment comes. That's the point of this whole thing. Uh, 1 Kings 11, 27, 1 Chronicles 13, 11, uh, a breach in this, I'm not going to turn there, but a breach in a city wall allows the enemy to come in. An intercessor stands in the gap, repairs the breach so that the enemy can't break a wreck havoc upon Yah's people. Again, this is not a an easy place to be because people don't want to hear what you have to say. Most people don't. And Ezekiel in, in a couple places talks about being a watchman on the wall. And he says, Yah says, look, your blood is on their heads if you don't warn the people that calamity is coming, the enemy is coming. But if you warn the people and they don't listen to you, then their blood's on their own heads. A lot of people talk about being a watchman on the wall, and they don't even have a clue what it means. Everybody likes to be a watchman on the wall. Like there's some prophetic guru 
Oh, I can open up the book of Revelation and I'm a watchman on the wall. I can see what's going to happen. Woo, woo, look at me. That's not what this is about, folks. It was to warn the people about what's coming. Why? Because of their disobedience to sound the alarm. How do you even know what disobedience is if you've thrown the Torah down the toilet? Well, you don't even know what Yah's definition of holy and profane is. If you are eating pork and you are working on Shabbat, you do not know what the Yah's definition of holy and profane is. Or if so, you're ignoring it. And you call yourself a watchman on the wall? Yeah, right. I've got a bridge to sell you. Ugh. Yeah, that's why it was hard for him then and now to find people to stand in the gap because there's a lot more to this than just saying a prayer and, and, and standing on the wall pretending to understand what prophecy, what's going to happen in the future. Like you've got a crystal ball, you've got some inside track with Elohim. You can look into your little crystal ball like some psychic or something and, and, and predict what's going to happen and send me your money and I'll give you your fortune. I'll give you your personal prophecy even to boot. Shame on all of them. Have mercy on us, Father. We all fall short. Yeah, I, back in Isaiah 58 verse 12 about the repair of the breach. Yeshua is the ultimate repair of all breaches. Hallelujah. That's music to my ears. We are to be a repairer as well. Our job is to build up the waste places, to raise up the foundations of many generations, to help turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. The last verses in the book of Malachi chapter 4. The last verses in the Old Testament. So back to Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 13, 5. I don't think we've read that one yet uh, Ezekiel 13 5 let's see what this one says oh <laughs> I'll start at the beginning and the word this is a this is woe to you foolish prophets this is the this chapter heading in my uh, New King James Bible. And the word of Jehovah came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to, say to those who prophesy out of their own heart. Or as Jeremiah says, or Ezekiel, uh, he talks about, yeah, dictates of their own hearts. That's another place. So they're, they're prophesying, prophesying out of their own mind, will, and emotions, not out of the spirit. Hear the word of Jehovah. Thus says uh, Adonai Jehovah, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, you prophets are like foxes in the desert. What's a fox in the desert? It's something you can't pin down, something you can't catch, something that's elusive. How many people, how many of you have known people that prophesied? quote unquote prophesied and when the prophecy didn't come to pass did they admit that they were a false prophet did they admit that they were carnal prophets did they admit that they missed it like did nathan did nathan the prophet when he told david to you know build the temple and then he came back and said whoa, whoa, whoa i misinterpreted that 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 word this is really what it means nathan had the honesty to admit that he interpreted the prophecy wrong incorrectly i have never ever heard a quote-unquote church prophet say, oh, uh, I missed that one. That date that I set didn't come to pass. Um, you know, that other thing. No, what do they do? They ignore it, sweep it under the rug, and go on, and a couple years later, they got a whole new batch of suckers who didn't remember the first thing that they said that was false, and they go on and they keep doing it. Because you know what? It's good for business. Good for money. Because everybody wants to hear what somebody thinks is in their crystal ball is going to come to pass. So you can't pin them down. They're elusive. These are not John the Baptist, Elijah type prophets. 
They're foxes in the desert, always changing the rules of the game, always making themselves look good, even though they are scum. Even though there will come a time when people will say, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, and I don't want to be a prophet. And Yah says, anybody that says to me, I speak for Elohim, I'm going to strike them down unless they truly have spoken for him. Yeah, there's those verses that say those things. You have not gone up into the gaps, verse 5, to build a wall for the house of Israel, to stand in the battle. There's the gaps again. In the battle on the day of Yovah, they have envisioned futility, false divination. Thus says Yovah, but Yovah has not sent them. I have not, they have spoken nonsense, verse 8, and so forth and so on. And here we have, verse 10, because here's the place I was looking for. Because they have seduced my people. Peace, when they're saying peace, when there is no peace. And one builds a wall and they plaster it with untempered mortar. It says, and say to those who plaster with untempered mortar that it will fall. There will be flooding and you, O oh great there will be flooding rain and you, O great hailstone, shall fall and a stormy wind shall tear it down. Surely when the wall is fallen, will it not be said to you, where is the mortar with which you plastered it? Therefore, says Yehovah, uh, Adonai Yehovah, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth my fury and there shall be a flooding rain in my anger and great hailstones in fury to consume it. So I shall break down the wall you have plastered with untempered mortar and bringing it down to the ground so that its foundations will be uncovered. That's what's happening in the United States and around the world. All the, everything is falling down all around us and we are seeing the wickedness and the evil behind everything whether it's the president, whether it's the FBI, whether it's the CIA, whether it's the Speaker of the House, the Senate president, whether it's the governors, whether it's the pastors, whether it's the pedophile priests, whether it's Hillary Clinton, whether it's Barack Obama, whether it's Michelle Obama, whether it's the Boy Scouts of America, whether it's the pedophile teachers in our schools, whether it's the, the you know, the human sex trafficking people out there that are getting exposed, whether it's those that went to Jeffrey Epstein and, and, and his pedophile uh, island, whose names are in that book, or on and on and go, everything, whether it's the, 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 the adulterous um, uh, pastors. All of this started, guys, with all of this exposure, the lid off the garbage can started back 20, 30 years ago with a few of the televangelists, in Christian televangelists, when it was found out that they were going to whores and committing adultery. It started with people like Jimmy Swaggart. Remember that? And a few others like that. Also, uh, Jim and Tammy Baker. Judgment begins first at the house of Elohim. Then it went to the pedophile priests in the Catholic Church. And then that thing has blown up. And then it's been going little by little through our society. All the institutions, all everything that we trusted in. Yah has been taken off the lid off the garbage can and people are seeing it for what it really is. Our government, our leaders, our judicial system, our legislative system, the Supreme Court, the governors, all the way, all the, the churches, all the way down the line. Yeah. Everything that has been done in secret is being brought out to the open. Yeah, it's because we have the internet. I get it. And social media. And everybody's got a cell phone. And they can take a picture of everything. And it's out there. We better be very careful what we say and what we do. He's looking for people. Yah is looking for people that will stand for truth and righteousness and will not back down and don't care about their reputations, don't care about the money, don't care about any of that. They just want Yeshua and they want the truth to stand up and to call his people to repentance and to build up the wall. 
to strengthen the people so that Yeshua has a holy and a chaste bride to come back to when he comes back. Amos 9.11 says that Yah will repair the fallen tabernacle of David and fill up its breaches and its gaps and repair its damage. Let's go there. And this is, I think, the last verse, and then we'll, we'll end for today. Amos 9, verse 11. Okay, Amos. One of those little books in the back of your Bible. It goes Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and Nahum. So there's your order. <laughs> Hosea, Joel, Amos. So you got Hosea, Joel, and Amos. And it's verse, um, what is it? 9, verse 11. I like Amos. He's one of my heroes. I say this again and again. First of all, Amos was a man of the earth. He was a nobody. He was out there picking figs. He was a tree trimmer, and he was a, she a sheep herder. And that's my background, a sheep herder, literally growing up, taking care of sheep on the family farm, and a tree trimmer. I'm an arborist, and I have a, I've had a tree care company for 40 years, almost going on 40 years. I've been pruning trees for money for 50 years. I've been pruning trees for... I, the first time I put pruners in my hands, I was eight. <laughs> and I just had my 64th birthday uh, a couple, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. So, so there you go. Uh, um, I, Amos was nobody. He was just out there doing his thing. And Yah zapped him and said, go prophesy to the, you know. Now, God, had, Elohim hasn't done that to me. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm just whatever I am. It doesn't matter. You don't need to put a label on me. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. But Amos says here in 4 verse, uh, let me look it up again, 9 verse 11. Oh, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. And then he goes on and talks blessing that will happen. When the plowman shall overtake the reaper, I will bring back the captives of my people. He's talking about the end times, you know, during the time of Yeshua's return and, and before and after. So that's the goal. And ultimately, Yeshua is going to be the ultimate repair of the breach. We are just helping his hands and his, surf, his feet, his mouthpieces here on this earth, here and now. But he's the one that's ultimately going to do that. But we are called to be doing that in the meantime. So I will I will leave it there. I hope um, this this message went in very differently than I thought it was going to go, but that's okay. Um, it still covered the subject, and um, I pray that those of you who have not been scandalized, this has not been um, a, a rock of offense or uh, scandalizo, that's the Greek word used to uh, describe many people that were offended or scandalized by the words of Yeshua. Those of you that have not been scandalized by what I have said, I've tried to give you the word and the truth. Um, and I pray that, you know, you, you will start to shore up the areas in your own life that are amiss, and so that you then can go out and and be the repair of the breach and stand in the gap for our, our, our brothers and sisters around us and for the world around us. Amen. All right. Blessings to you all. Shalom.